Um, thank you all for coming out. Um, and thank you all for making this movie and sharing your time with us. Mac, first of all, I want to thank you for your service. Um, and I think the warrior remains inside of you because Mac had gallbladder surgery yesterday. And here he is with us. I hope you're feeling okay, or at least faking it. <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> and before we talk uh, about the movie, I have a quick question for you and Bibi. And that is, there was a wedding recently that I think uh, is, is kind of a sequel to the film. Um, who got married and uh, who was part of the event? Mac, you want to tell us? Yes, uh, I uh, was lucky enough to meet my beautiful bride, uh, Stephanie Osborne, and uh, she is a Christian. So we had decided to have a Christian Muslim ceremony. So in the whole processing of this, we had uh, been able to get Saber, uh, Bibi's husband, to officiate the Islamic side of it, and Bibi did all the cooking. <laughs> so there you go. Bibi, I want to ask you about, about that ceremony, because in a way, that's almost like a tangible sign of what was accomplished inside that mosque. Just about the wedding? About the, yeah, the, that, oh, there no. was a wedding that was officiated by, uh, by somebody you know near and dear. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for being here this evening. Good evening to you. I would just like to just briefly share about the wedding. I know Stephanie and him, we came to a couple program together, and she had come to the center. I know her mom. She's our CPA. And uh, I said, oh, do you know, you know my mom? I said, okay. <laughs> But anyway, since they were together, and I said, this is like, I mean, again, naturally comes out of us. My husband and I, we told them that uh, we will be happy to do a marriage. And obviously, I want to share that with you, the thought from Stephanie, like, you know, I'm Christian, very strong Christian, and he's Muslim. That's why we're like, not sure. I said, no problem. We can have a Christian minister for you. I know very open-minded minister, Dr. Ron Naylor. And we'll have our Afghan, uh, my husband, minister for you or another one. We could do both uh, <laughs> celebration together. It was one of the amazing experience, how we did it. The Christian did it first, and then we did it second. And we all had the Afghan dinner together. I said, I will be happy to cook, and I will be happy to host it in my house. I have done it for other people, too. <laughs> I have experience. Thank you. So if anybody's thinking about getting married, go to Muncie, and Bibi will look after you. <laughs> Mac, some people talk about a calling. It's some force beyond themselves compelling them to do something. It could be professional, like a call to be a journalist, unless I misheard it. Um, or it could also be spiritual. It could be something you know, beyond our understanding. And I'm wondering, as you think about what compelled you to visit the mosque in the first place, what was in your mind at the time? Uh, at the particular time, what I had wanted to do was get the information that I needed to prove that these were bad people. And to get that proof, I needed to go to the source. I mean, I, I wasn't scared. I mean, I did feel uneasy being around them at first, but I wasn't scared. But I knew because of my daughter, who, you know, besides Bibi, they're the heroes of this film. I'm not. I'm a byproduct of their effort. I'll be honest with you. I, 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 I think calling me a hero is a very disservice to the film, a very big disservice to the film. It's BB and my daughter. But I needed that. I needed that to be able to, to, to prove the way I felt was right, and that's why I went. But I think it's fair to say that in this case, Allah works in mysterious ways. Because had you not gone there to confirm your hatred, you wouldn't have had your heart opened and seen this community for what it is. Well, and that's very true. Uh, so, so like in today's times, how we have so much hate in the world, I was not drinking the Kool-Aid. I was actually handing the Kool-Aid out, OK? And I always thought my destiny was to come home in a flag-draped coffin. Mm. I was good with that. Because in this country, you're forever known as a hero, man. It don't matter. But I learned we don't pick our destinies. They're picking for us. 
or they're chose for us. I don't want to sound like I'm from Indiana here. <laughs> they're picking for us. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, our creator, he predestines our, our destinies in life. And, and mine was actually to bring change, to present change to people. And unfortunately, for me, I had to be all the way over here in this ugly, dark place before I could come back here. And that's why he put people like BB in my life. I, I can never, in, in a million years, thank her. You know, I, I used the line one time, seems to have caught on, that there is not enough ink in the world to write the thank you notes that I need to write to her and the community for what they've done to me because she saved my life. She saved her life, and she saved the life of the whole community because we would have all, well, by now my appeals would have ran out, so I probably would have been executed, but, you know, I mean, we, we all would have been gone. But yeah. remember, a picture is worth a thousand words, and there's 24 frames per second, so there are 24 <laughs> pictures per second, and if you count the words, you've written a lot of those thank you notes already in this film. Um, Joshua, I'd like to ask you about when you first heard about the story and started thinking about how to tell it, because as remarkable as the story is, it's also deeply personal to the participants and in a way very private as well. Yeah. I, thank you, John. Uh, I, um, I read about this story in a, in a newspaper article, and you know, I was like, could this be real, you know? And I, at the time, I was making a series about, um, about American Muslims called Secret Life of Muslims. I grew up facing a lot of anti-Semitism. And uh, when, I, when I saw what happened after 9-11 in this country and the Islamophobia that was going on, I felt like, you know, I felt a connection. And I felt like I could do something uh, with film so I started telling these stories about American Muslims, and this was actually the 25th film in the series, this film tonight. And, you know, I just, uh, when I, I, first I found Mac, and I, we brought him to New York, and we interviewed him, and then I, we thought, like, we've got to find the congregants. So we were trying to find Bibi and Saber, and couldn't find them. Couldn't, uh, they never answered. We called, and, and then I found out that BB had been very ill and was actually had been in a coma, and she had just come out of the coma. And we finally reached her, and you know, well, you can talk about <laughs> it, but that was the moment when she she said, "This like this is meant to be. This film is meant to be. I this is what I want to do with my life now. That I that you. I mean, you almost died, right? And you." And so this film is very important to Bibi, I think. Yeah. Wow. It was amazing, you know, how, I mean, this is part of my life. I've been helping in my local, local community. I'm very much involved with the university, with the mayors. I've been part of different board, Rotarian. I serve on different capacity and volunteerism. I've been totally blessed. But in fighting Islamophobia was one of my things. I say, you know, I have three beautiful daughters who has covered and I brought them to this country. We chose this country by choice. And if I can make it better with whatever capacity I have, I would love to do that. And as I came, God gave me a second chance to live. I'd say, you know, I'm doing that through my personal effort in my community. This will happen, this film, this documentary, I didn't know this gonna get to this level, but will be a message, positive message for humanity, even if I'm dead. I was dead, I came back to life, and there may be a reason. And when he gave me his story, it was so compelling, touching my heart, that, oh my God, it's a beautiful message. And then I told him, even though I'm sick, I just came back from coma. My son was home helping me, Zaki, who is in the film. That's why he's there. He was working from home, trying to help me. And then I told him to come, and we would do this. And this all happened out of, like, without any thinking. It was just God's plan. <laughs> and our beautiful heart that we wanted to ha make this happen. If there was also some sort of divine intervention in producing the film, <laughs> Lena, I want to ask you about how you came onto the project, because uh, you bring an expertise that maybe Joshua doesn't have. How would you describe your involvement in it and your collaboration in making it? Yeah, I come from narrative feature world. Um, and so 
a lot of my career had always been dedicated towards sort of bringing understandings of certain communities or issues. And it's hard because in the narrative, Hollywood space, quote unquote, um, people have very, you know, attention spans are only so much. But I'd wanted it so much. I went, I was in high school when 9-11 happened. I remember what it felt like and how people sort of turned on me, like kids, kids I went to school with and I could tell was coming down from their parents. And so to see what capacity, I was like, it's amazing like that Joshua here was able to tell a story that did what I had like been yearning for from my childhood, which is that like we'd always said, we're like, guys, just come into our house and talk to us. And that's what this film really does. And I think it, it operates for a lot of cultures that like what can happen when you literally just stop thinking of your perceptions of people and like literally have dinner with Vivi <laughs> or, you know, with your regular person. And so I, I was really excited to come on board and sort of um, see what we could do in sort of taking this out to um, people, especially like in this environment right now when there's so much hate in the country. It's really like, oh, you know, be his daughter or be Bibi. Be that source of kindness and, and cross that barrier for people you don't understand and just talk to a Mac or talk to, to these people. What can happen? I was like, God, I always wish um, that story could get out there. And to Lena's point, um, if you want to have a meal with Bibi, well, she, she actually, I'm not kidding, baked cookies for all of you. Um, and we're going to have a reception afterwards that, wow. um, so you can have BB's. We don't have a meal, but we have cookies. So BB, BB brings cookies to every screening now for the audience. I'm not kidding. It's, They're famous. It's amazing. So, Joshua, I want to ask you about timing. It's always tricky when you make a film like this that becomes more topical because that means that things are getting worse, not better. So when did you start on the project? It's obviously available now. You can tell your friends they can find it just by Googling Stranger at the Gate and going on YouTube or the New Yorker channel there. And when you started on it to today, let's talk about how the movie's reception might be different. Because I think everybody up here can agree that things are no better. <coughs> when I was thinking about doing this film before, when, before I came across this story. I, I was feeling honestly depressed about our world, about our country, about the state of affairs, about the division that we see around us. And when I came across this story, I was like, oh, wait, this is, this is, this is the answer. You know, it's so simple. Uh, and, and the story gave me hope. It made me feel less depressed. And I thought, if I tell this story, that'll probably be how other people hopefully will feel too, that they'll see a little bit of a blueprint or a roadmap uh, out of where we are. And it's a simple roadmap. It's like we joke around, it's what would BB do? You know, mm -hmm. how, do we treat, how should we treat people? Um, how should we think about others? And uh, it's simple. It's be kind, be open, uh, welcome the stranger. And uh, that was inspiring to me. And so when um, we, made, we, f we shot the film last summer and we edited it through the winter and it, we released it, it was sort of rolling out slowly this year, unfortunately, it does feel like things aren't necessarily getting better. Uh, but there's hope in this, in this film. And I think everyone who sees it feels, feels that. And it's a reminder that there, you know, our shared humanity is strong. And when we think about that, I, I feel more hopeful because I think we can all find it. Mac, in telling this story and in making this film, you are revealing so much about yourself and about how you struggled um, with this hatred. Is it hard for you to even watch the film or think about the person you were before? And is this experience difficult for you? Uh, that's a good question. Thanks. Uh, I, I would be lying if I said no. Um, it is difficult in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm ashamed of the person I used to be. You know, there is a level of self-forgiveness that I still have not been able to reach. You know, and that's a personal thing. It's, it's a journey, right? And I'm still on that journey. Um, with this film, it, 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 it makes me feel that much closer 
to accomplishing what I'm supposed to accomplish. Because this movie is called action. That's what it's about. You know, it's not about me. It's about somebody who met somebody he didn't like was able to change the way he thought about those people. It, 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 and it, if you think this movie was about Islam, you really didn't pay attention. Please watch it again. Because it wasn't. It was about hatred. It was about our shared humanity. It's about who we are as human beings that we don't even want to realize that we are so much alike. It's scary. And I think that's a big thing. It's scary. You know, I don't care whether you're Christian, whether you're Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, it doesn't matter. We're still here. We still have a job to do in society, and that's to make this life a better place for everybody. You know, I, I, I am going to say everybody in the audience, I'm pretty sure, is probably 25 plus. Right? We got a whole generation coming up. You know? For some of us, maybe it's too late. I don't know. We got a whole other generation coming up. There's the change. There it is. When this first film came out, the very first Secret Life of Muslims came out, you know, Josh talked to me and said, well, you know, there's going to be a lot of comments. I guarantee you not all of them are going to be good. He said, you can put a video of kittens and puppies on, on YouTube and somebody's going to have something hateful to say, right? He was not wrong. Even though most of the comments were positive, there were some hateful ones. I'm a traitor. I should just kill myself. Blah, 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 right? Whatever. But there was one in particular, and there was, there was other nice ones, but this one in particular really stood out to me because this is what made it all worthwhile. And like you said, how I feel about putting my life out there, this is what made it worthwhile. This guy, in a very colorful way, because he talks the way I used to, but I, the PG version is, if a tough guy like you can change the way he thinks about things, I guess I can too. That's what this film's about. Not about my conversion. Not about the difference between religions. You know? It's, it's just the, be the beauty of humanity and what we are cheating ourselves by not doing this. And we can't blame it on anybody else. It's our fault. It's our fault. We got to act. I want to ask Joshua and Lena about the role that entertainment, Hollywood, pop culture has in promulgating stereotypes. Um, and I'm going to challenge you on a phrase. You said Islamophobia. Phobia is a fear. I would call it hatred or bigotry. Um, the station is working hard on how we talk about things. Very careful about language. Um, I use the word transphobia, homophobia. And somebody said it's not fear, it's hatred, it's bigotry. So. Let's talk about anti whatever you want it to be, but I'm gonna talk about anti-Muslim feelings. Uh, Stacy Smith, who's done some great research at USC as part of her Annenberg Inclusion Initiative, looked at Hollywood and Muslims in it. It's a very, spoiler, it's a very short and unhappy book. Here are the numbers. In TV, they looked at the identity of more than 6,000 writers, directors, and producers across 128 US, US series. Less than 1% of those people were Muslim. By the way, if you don't know, Muslims account for a quarter of the Earth's population, 24 to 25%. Film, across 1,500 top grossing films from 2007 to 2021, there were only 12, 11 men and one woman, Muslims that worked as directors, writers, or producers. But this is where it's really damaging. Out of 9,000 characters, in the top grossing films from 2017 to 2019, 1.6% were Muslim. And without getting into the numbers, I can tell you most of them were not playing heroes. They were playing villains and they were playing terrorists. So when you think about the role that the film business has in creating images and what you're working against, and Lena, what you're probably dealing with trying to sell your work, how would you describe what the industry needs to do and where you see it going? Um, yeah, I'm very familiar with that study and I feel like I deal with this 
every day ever since I entered this industry. When I was young, I remember my mom taking us to where like the Muslim community was going to, I think WB, where um, the siege was coming out. And I was young, and I still remember how hard that was for the Muslim community. Like, there was a terrorist who went on board, and before he did, they made sure they showed him, like, doing the ritual washing before he prays and all those things. If and you things don't know, this is an Edward Zwick film that, to my mind, is one of the most hateful movies about Islam that any American filmmaker has ever made. Continue. Yeah, and it was really formative to me when I was young, and I thought things would change so much. And small things have changed, but by and large, I think, what do they always say? You're either, when they show Muslims, they're billionaires, belly dancers, or bombers, for the most part. I will add, or they're <laughs> abused women, or things, then there's a, there's a few outliers. And it's really hard, and now I actually work in film and TV, and I've seen it, and I can't say too much about, you know, which shows this and that. And I did my own controlled studies, it is easier for me to put a nun in the background walking by. And does that happen very often? It does not happen very often. <laughs> I can get a nun to walk by in the background of a scene easier than I can get a woman with a headscarf, which you see all the time. Because people have people involved, and there are a lot, there are a lot of open shows, but they just have an association that if they're there, like, no, they need to be there for a storyline about how they're being oppressed or whatever it is, a Muslim center. You don't see BBs on the show. And nowadays you're having some perceptions, but Hollywood has this thing where they don't want to show a practicing Muslim in a normal or positive way. And I don't know what it is, and we're trying to tackle it. Um, and so it's really lovely to see a movie like this. I was like, thank God, you know? <laughs> Joshua, what about you? As, as I, I, I'll just call you an ally here. Okay, I'll, say, I'll take that. Um, we, we've made films about this, short films. One is about um, Ahmed Ahmed, who's a, um, he was, he started as an actor and he could only be cast as a terrorist. And he finally just quit and gave up and became a comedian. And now he tells jokes about that. Um, but he's a very great popular comedian. Uh, another story, um, we made a film about Mustafa Ali, who's a um, WWE wrestler. And when he was coming up, they cast him as the bad guy. And he had to play the bad guy, and he hated it. And little kids would, you know, he'd come out in the ring at the W. He was in WrestleMania, and, you know, little kids would come out. And he could see that they hated him. These six-year-old kids hated him. They were shaking their fists at him. And he said, I can't do this anymore. And so he changed his persona against everybody's will, and he, and he became a good guy. And he's even more popular now, which gives me hope, and I think should give others hope, that we, that change can happen, and it can be successful, and it, it, it can be, it's a good thing. So I do feel hopeful. I don't know how you do, but I mean, it, it's Somehow, slowly yeah. changing. <laughs> I just right? wish it was a little faster, that's all. <laughs> um, we have reserved some time for audience questions, but I have one last question for Mac and BB, and that is, what's going on at the mosque now? Um, there's, I, I suspect there's a refugee movement, uh, probably some Afghan refugees that are coming into the city. Tell us what's, what gets you excited about, about the work at the mosque right now. Uh, great question. I, I, I call my community a beautiful Muncia, the city. Uh, I always refer to it that. I say, within well, my ability, if I can make it shine to the whole world, I'll make it shine. That beautiful community, small community, we were able to bring. That's, again, blessing of my connection with the Afghan and the camp and the State Department. And I work with the resettlement agency, Catholic Charity, and Exodus. Was able to bring uh, uh, 27, no, 37 families, mm. and 127 people. And that was not easy. We provided everything from uh, housing to essentials. I mean, I remember ordering essential for a family. It took me hours to from A to Z that to cover everything. We'll prepare the house and we'll bring a family from the camp. That's what I said, like other big city like Indianapolis and Fort Wayne and uh, Lafayette, the kind of surrounding city contacted me that what was your magic and you share your model with us. We were not able to bring even one family. We have two families that we're working with. And we had a hard time. How did you do this? I said, again, it's a beautiful Muncie and my beautiful community. Uh, I started involving my mayor, 
the university president, the IU health president, the Meridian Health. I have medical community. It's a blessing that I have a very strong connection. I brought everybody on board in all the churches. I'm also co-founder of an interfaith group that I serve. We choose a topic. We will all be repeating ourselves. That's just to give you this highlight of that. And just to bring everybody on the board, I say instead of every church helping, let's combine our effort. Instead of one family, instead of five, we can bring 15, 20, and over 30, above and beyond. That was the success of our unity, whether it was, uh, I don't really care about parties, Republican, Democrat, all parties are part of it. All uh, Jewish community, Muslim community, Hindu community, Catholic, Christians, Methodists, Friends Memorial, Baha'is, everybody was part of this project. <laughs> and that's why we were so successful. We were very blessed and it was very good example to the others and I shared that model. And that's what the beautiful community is coming together. And I just had a celebration to end my program. Six months urgent assistant was one year. And I invited the same group to a church and I cooked for them and I thank them, thank them, and thank them. All the volunteers, all the welcome families each family have. That's what our community, I'm part of the group throughout the United States with refugee resettlement. Like Muncie was standing out, we had done like so much extra for them. We spoiled them to the point that um, they all called me mother, and uh, even if they're 70 years old, I might be old, but everyone called me mother, and we had a great time with them. The Islamic Center is accommodating all of them. Their children are coming to the Sunday school. Uh, every Sunday, we're taking care of them, and that's part of their religious part, and they're part of the large community. They all have a job contributing. We had over 500 jobs open. Some of the factories are surviving because of them. We're very blessed to have them. We call them new neighbors, not refugees. Wow. And Mac, I'm gonna give you the last minute uh, of your thoughts about what's going on in the mosque and, and uh, anything else you'd like to share. Well, first of all, just to caveat off of, off of Bibi, that's why she's the hero. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Um, just, in, 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 again, it, just an overwhelming thanks to her. You know, my daughter, a, a, she was the first hero in this because she's the one who pushed it and she's a freshman in college now uh, I got a text from her about I don't know a month ago maybe I don't know I I don't remember stuff I forgot what I just said so don't remember. <laughs> but I used to take her to the daddy daughter dances and some of the pictures you saw up there was us getting ready to go to daddy daughter dances right always wanted to go to daddy daughter dance that was just a big deal she never would dance with me She's embarrassed. She won't dance with dad, right? So I get a text. She apologized for not dancing with me all those times. And, you know, even though she's older now and she don't have time for dad like she used to, you know, things like that, they remind, remind me, you know, of the changes she made in my life, you know, along with BB, along with the rest of the community, you know? BB showed just in this action she's done, it was just the Afghan resettlement. Oh my gosh. You had every walk of life had a hand in this mm -hmm. in our community. Mm -hmm. See, that's what happens. You know, there's a saying in the Quran it says, you know, God split us up into different nations and tribes so that we can learn from one another. Mm -hmm. Now, I always say this if we would have actually done that, we'd have made COVID look like a head cold. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you proved that you can make a change, so maybe your daughter can change and invite you at some future point to dance with you. Um, <laughs> any questions? Here's a mic. I hope it's on. We'll find out soon. Yeah. If you have a question, please put up your hand. Don't be shy. Uh, here's one over here, kind of house right. question is for the whole uh, panel. Could you stand just so we can sure, hear you sure. better, if that's okay? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Shahid is my name. I'm from Pakistan, your neighbor. Been to <laughs> Afghanistan a couple of times in the good old days. Uh, so my question is for the whole um, panel. So is geopolitics okay. has anything to do with the hatred 
against the Muslims right now uh, or the foreign policy of the uh, superpowers? Lena, I'm, like, I'm gonna give that one to you, okay? <laughs> Well, You're then. the designated geopolitical expert here. There we here. go. My old poli sci major. There you go. Um, I actually think that what it, what's happening across the world is only sort of, well, I come from Hollywood, so that's my answer, is augmented by um, what we see. Right. You know, a lot of what we see, what we write about, media, et cetera, um, gives us perceptions on a lot of things. I noticed when I was growing up, uh, things that were happening across the world. My perception came from how I saw those people on TV, how I, how I read about them, um, and it hasn't been helping to, to see how those things have been sort of inflamed. Like, I, I'll go back home to um, my family, uh, my parents are from India, where there's an almost genocide happening over mm -hmm. there. Nobody knows about it here. Mm -hmm. So it's what people are, what those in power choose to tell us about and have us think and feel about, I think plays a larger role than the actual geopolitics that are happening over there. So. Uh, next question, put up your hand, we'll bring the mic to you. <clears throat> Got time for one or two more. Don't be shy, there you go, right there in the middle. I'm wondering if the film is being used to reach out to you know, Christian nationalists and some of these hate groups that we have in our society. You know, have you confronted people? Do you have these conversations with them? Are you trying to be an evangelist? Not Obviously not for Islam, but for tamping down this hatred of Islam in our country. And if so, what are you finding? Do you feel that you have an effective voice where you can reach these guys who used to be like you? Well, I mean, of course, I'm not an expert. Um, you know, I never thought of it in, in the terms of being, in a, like, being evangelistic about it. But I, and it's not just about Islam. I don't speak up to defend Islam. I speak up to defend people. Uh, my, my thing is to speak for those that can't speak for themselves. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to sit down with Christian nationalists, Klan members, neo-Nazis, uh, evangelicals, whatever. I, I have no problem with that. You know, I tell people, well, I've been stabbed, I got blown out of a building, I've been married five times, and I'm vaccinated. You can't hurt me, okay? <laughs> All right? I welcome the opportunity. I've, I, I've said things to Josh and other people where I'd like to actually get on, get on camera and sit down with these people and just basically have like a little forum. Why? Why do you hate me so much? I, I just want to know. And then go from there. Because I believe this change, just like this, the film proved it. A smile and a conversation. Go from there. I, I'm, not trying, I, you know, I'm not trying to make anybody into a Muslim. That has nothing to do with me. That was my journey. But I do have a place and a duty and responsibility to try to take away hatred. And I feel very personal about that because I was such a catalyst to hatred. I'll just add that, that. Oh, something. Go ahead. I was just going to say that we, we do have a partnership with um, Facing History and Ourselves. And there are in 170,000 170, teachers across mm. the U.S are going to be using this film in their curriculum. Uh, and, yes. wow. <laughs> and when we showed the film at um, Bibi's Mosque as a sneak preview, someone stood up when the film was over and said, every American needs to see this film. And that's, that's our goal. We're going to, I don't know if we'll achieve it, but we're going to try. So <laughs> we have a lot of plans. Yeah. Any last question? We have one, time for one more right here in the front. Hang on a sec. The mic's coming. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay. I'm just curious about your name. Um, uh, my grandchildren call me BB, uh, but that means grandma in Swahili. So I'm wondering whether that's that's your name, real name, or are, are everybody calling you grandma as well? <laughs> Great question. <coughs> I've been a mother for many, maybe years. 
eight countries uh, in uh, South Africa that I have kept those kids in my house. And they're older or younger, they call me mother. And I could be a grandmother for everybody. You're so right, Bibi, we also call grandmother in Afghanistan. But we also call, if your name is Elizabeth, we say Bibi Elizabeth, like with respect, is given. And my name, that's what my father had given me. It was Lal Bibi, it was added to that. And I just took that out to make it easy for my, I chose to be in this country. I want to make life easy for everyone. <laughs> I said, just call me BB, just take that part of it off of it. <laughs> That's good, good, good humor to it. But I think just to uh, get a little bit back to uh, the uh, first question for Brother Rick, uh, what was it? I forgot my thought. About the calling? The first question? Oh, the sharing this film. I oh, think, yeah. please. Oh. I mean, this is the message. As I say, I could be dead, these people can hear it. And each and every one of us of us have obligation toward each other to make a better understanding, whether it's through smile, whether it's through effort, whether it's through cooking, whatever it might take. And when I see a little conflict in my community, I try to invite them over, and we sit on the table. This is very normal to me. I give you one quick thing in my class. Uh, how do we make that change? I had a student on my right, right side and a student on my left. I was a boy and a girl. So my grandparents hate Muslim. Uh, I say, because we're watching a film regarding the wars and problems, because they, they, well, they only watch uh, Fox News. And uh, I'd say, okay, I would love to invite your parents. That was when I was taking classes in Ball State University. I say, be not because of anything else, because I don't want them to, in this age, to have the hate in their heart and then die with this hate. I would like to help them and invite them to my house for dinner and I went to a club, and I did the same thing, these old women just running to me, it was a very conservative club, that I had a scars in my heart for Muslim, what I have heard, and you heal my scars. And I think if we can make even one person, through my ability to heal their scar and misunderstanding, to have some clear cautious, that for my human, I, we owe it to you guys. Why would you be scared of a Muslim because I'm covering uh, how I look? that you guys, you should be comfortable. We owe it, I tell the Muslim people, we owe it to them, we need to educate and we need to share that we're all the same human being with a different look, but we, we all want the same thing for life. And you baked cookies. So <laughs> I wanna thank everybody for showing up. I really wanna thank our panel. I wanna thank Lena, I wanna thank Bibi, I wanna thank Joshua and Mac for sharing your life and your journey with us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie. We'll see you outside. <laughs>